and welcome. Thank you for coming along to today's iSpy360 webinar. In this Future Friday session, we're going to be investigating the differences between the traditional camera and the smartphone camera. And I'm honored to have Human Khalili and Patrick Giles join us for our discussion. Human and Patrick are both Hollywood directors and screenwriters. They are the team behind Olive, the first feature film to be shot entirely on a smartphone. Olive is a heartwarming film about a little girl who transforms the lives of three people without speaking a word. The film stars the incredible Gina Rowlands and was an Oscar contender when it was first released. We are overjoyed to have the minds behind this wonderful film with us today. Thank you both for joining me. Now, first things first, would you be able to tell me a little bit more about yourselves? Sure. I uh, worked at the same radio station for the past 20 years in San Francisco called uh, Alice at 97.3. And it was uh, through one of my co-workers, a woman named Sarah, that I met uh, Pat. And uh, that's kind of, we were kind of distant acquaintances and then started talking about film and one thing led to another. And we were kind of, you know, in, in a foxhole together making a movie. Incredible. And you, Pat? I am a uh, independent filmmaker in California, and as uh, Human said, we you know we met through a mutual friend. Uh, I do drone work. I got my so in California in the United States, you need a drone pilot's license. So I've been doing a lot of that, and I mainly focus on you know short narratives lately and real estate videos. Brilliant stuff. So with Olive, your most recent film. Tell us more about that and the thought process behind why you chose to use a smartphone rather than a more traditional camera. So uh, I'm an immigrant to the United States. Uh, my mom escaped Iran with one suitcase, $5,000 and a three-year-old boy in 1978. And there was so much goodwill shown towards me and my mom that uh, that idea stayed with me. It, it never left. And, you know, I've done my fair share of missions tripped and helped as many people as I could. And uh, so the whole idea of being a good Samaritan was born from life experiences. Uh, during the year outside of 2020, the regular years, um, I see about 200 movies in the theater. So I see about four movies a week. And every year in the United States, there's about 950 films released in theaters. And as a filmmaker, you can't just think of a story and actors and a plot. Like you have to be thinking as big of a picture as you can at all times. And, you know, I was inspired uh, in 2010 to come up with a really innovative forward thinking way of shooting a movie. And that is basically how the idea of shooting with a cell phone was like kind of it came to me came to me from above <laughs> and how did you find that pat working with a smartphone rather than a traditional camera there were challenges in the beginning we did this a, a while back i mean the iterations and the advancements in smartphone technology there you know the phones are getting s smaller processors and oddly bigger screens i remember at a time when cell phones were getting smaller and smaller now they've decided to let the phones be large enough again so ergonomically you can handle them and see them. But the challenge back then, you know, phones were about the size of a typical phone today. And the challenge was the optics. I, I, I like the cell phone for wide shots. You don't require a lot of depth of field or cinematic look, but to get intimate, you know, um, depth of field, directors like to use focus to draw the eye to certain parts of the screen. And that was not possible. So we, our challenge was, First of all, audio. Audio is really bad if you're more than one foot away from the cell phone. So we knew we were going to do secondary sound. So that was a challenge. We would have to sync all the audio for the entire movie, which is not unusual for a feature film. And the optics. So I elected to put prime lenses, 35 millimeter, like DSLR lenses on the outside optics of the cell phone. To do that, I had to run through vibrating ground glass which would flip and flop the image. So there were a lot of challenges. You know, I'd hope that everyone take a look at the trailer and look at the result. It, it doesn't really look like a cell phone, in my opinion. It has that depth of field, that sort of richness. And, you know, in post-production, you can do a lot of other things with saturation and 
and color. But the challenge was audio and optics. But the form factor was lovely. It was a small camera. It could go anywhere. I even saw when I was doing my research on the film that I believe there was only around nine days of editing when shooting was completed. Uh, nine days to a rough cut, but, you know, we, we worked hard after that. You know, it's one of those things, 90% of the work is done <laughs> right in the beginning. And then the last 10% really, especially with, you know, art and media, you really have to just check every frame. So yeah, that was a pretty aggressive quote on our part, but we did turn it around quick to get to first, first cut. Fantastic. Definitely. So, so what smartphone camera did you use? And what made you choose that specific model? So uh, I had I had a couple friends that worked at Palm. I don't know if you remember that cell phone company, Palm. Uh, they they had a phone a while ago called the Palm Pre, and they had asked me to shoot some stuff with their phone, and and I couldn't, I just couldn't make it work. The the camera on it just wasn't good enough. So when you took that little image and you blew it up, it it just degraded too much. And uh, I, I started doing some research around that time to see what company was going to come out with a cell phone that could shoot in true high definition. And all the all all signs were pointing to Nokia. And uh, they were wise to to put that on their cell phones first. And so I, I had gotten a hold of somebody in Finland who was fairly high up. And I I called him every week for eight months and said, you need to send me that phone. And I was, I was a bit relentless. And uh, I, I think we were one of the first 20 people in the country to get it. And then as soon as I got it, uh, I, I handed it over to Pat. And, you know, he's a pretty humble guy. But at the end of the day, the amount of work he put into figuring out how to attach a 35 millimeter lens to the end of the phone and build a casing for it. I mean, after we would shoot, he would basically have to pull everything apart every day and then rebuild it for the next day's shoot and you know we I think it was a 25 day shoot so he was he was pulling things apart and putting it back together so we look as a cell phone it was the Nokia N8 it wasn't a great cell phone but as a camera it was it was just good enough for what we were trying to pull off having seen the trailer and some of the footage I couldn't even believe it had been taken with a cell phone it just looked so incredible had you ever considered using a smartphone to make any kind of video content before you first approached Olive? Yeah, I had. I, uh, I, I, like I said, I was trying to do a bunch of stuff with Palm Pre uh, back in the day. Uh, but once we got the Nokia N8, we were entirely focused in on that. And then obviously the other cell phone manufacturers slowly caught up with Nokia and then ultimately passed Nokia up. But it wasn't, it was just... There was, there was a prize to be had by being first, and, and that was one of the driving factors for us. Fantastic. And what about you, Pat? Had you ever tried using a smartphone to make video content before, Olive? Smartphones are a really valuable tool for scouting and framing. So everyone has a camera in their pocket. They have a video in their pocket. They have GPS in their pocket. They've got a lot of powerful tools that filmmakers use. Um, so yes, we were putting early cell phones, you know, flat cell phones, not flip phones, but early cell phones on our drones, right? So we found those cameras to be really kind of cool. And, you know, you always, uh, yes, I mean, I think we all are filmmakers now. So yes, I was using a cell phone right when they put a camera in it, especially when they did the two-way cameras, it got really interesting. Like, look at us right now. We are if yeah, I'm using a cell phone right now and I'm chatting with you all and hopefully the picture quality is okay in the truck. I'm in the central Valley doing some uh, wildfire mitigation work here. California's having trouble with wildfires. So we're flying drones. And so, you know, cell phone technology is very powerful. Uh, just, you know, they say with filmmaking, what's the great greatest piece of advice? Well, the one piece of advice that I heard over and over again that I took is just do it, just make it. And you can do that right now. You can walk out or stay in your house. <laughs> Maybe you should stay in your house and make a video. See what framing looks like to you. See what, you know, uh, art and backgrounds and, you know, that kind of thing. Everyone has an artistic eye. Use your eye. You've got a great tool. 
I'd like to add one thing to what Pat just said. You know, when you make a movie, you have to raise money. And our main investor uh, is a guy named Chris Kelly. And Chris is, uh, he was the first executive at Facebook and he's part owner of a basketball team in California called the Sacramento Kings. But as soon as I pitched him, he wrote a check for a hundred thousand dollars. And I, and I couldn't believe it because he was the 14th guy I pitched and everybody else was very dismissive, but I, I, I was holding this check and I, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. And I, I said, how, why, why are you doing this? How, you, like we're, we're peripheral friends and he pulled out his cell phone he held it up and he said human do you understand what you're about to do I said no I, I have no idea I guess I, I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> and he said you are democratizing filmmaking and what Pat just said about you know just go out and do it he's right like just go out and do it you're good it's gonna suck you're gonna it's gonna be terrible the first time but by the fifth or sixth time you're gonna actually have something that's gonna be watchable and that's it. As you mentioned with how powerful the technology is and how accessible it's all become, all you have to do is try. And once you've tried it a few times, it's innovative. It's very quick to pick up. Now with that said, where do you see smartphone technology going in the next two to five years? Well, uh, let's talk a little bit more down the road. Let's talk about the next like 15 years, okay? <laughs> Two to five years, it's basically going to be this. It's going to be the same phone that you have. But I was doing a bit of research on this. And obviously, you know, you have so many different forecasters. But the the three, two, the two of the three ideas that I sort of buy into is um, if you saw the Avengers movies or the Iron Man films, how Tony Stark could, you know, project holograms from his phone. I think that's a real possibility in the next 20 years. I think that's really, um, I've also read that they're gonna, they, they're they working on a type of plastic and metal that can bend. So you could actually bend your cell phone around your wrist. You could fold it up, put it in your pocket. I've, I've, I've read that. That seems like a little bit of a stretch, but it's, it's possible. Um, the other thing that I heard is uh, they're going to try to make cell phones like able to be self-charged so whether it's by movement they'll be able to to be charging at all times or through solar panels on the phone <laughs> which that that seems reasonable and then the one that i don't buy into is uh did you ever see the movie her with joaquin phoenix oh, i don't believe i have that's awful isn't it it is brilliant it's brilliant uh but it's it's they're basically saying look your cell phone's going to be so encompassing that you won't need friends like your cell phone will be your one and only true friend. Uh, that, that's kind of a darker future, but it's possible. Mm. <laughs> what about you, Pat? Do you see anything where photography with smartphones could be going in the future? I do think they're, they're going to two ways. One is inward and outward. I think outward phones are going to get more into like human such projection, whether it's just simple projection where instead of having to look down at a small screen, you can project on the surfaces, maybe like glass surfaces or just a wall. And you can, you know, projection, I think is going to be a big deal. The phones are going to become outward. But then as far as inward, I think they're going to try to get into more biometrics like human talked about, but maybe monitoring your body. Some companies are already doing that. And also I think um kinetic charging i think is a possibility but as far as that uh, cameras are just getting better and better hdr is where everybody wants to go high dynamic range video if you're not familiar with that where right now if you look at my um you know i'm looking at you right now and in your window i can see sort of the just a faint shadow of a beautiful view in a mountain and you're the only one who can enjoy that because the camera can't see that yet but one day we'll get about 15 20 15 or 20 stops of range where i'll see you and you look great, by the way. And I'll also see that beautiful picture window behind you. So that's where it's going. People are working on optics. Again, you know, sound is, is the thing that really ruins video for me. So hopefully they'll pay attention to, you know, the aural and the physical limitations of, you know, the environment we live in. But they're only getting better. They're not getting worse, depending, yeah. on, depending on your philosophical opinion of <laughs> community. Yes. yes, definitely. That's the really exciting part, though. So even though you both use the mobile phone, 
I think, Pat, you touched on this a little bit already. Uh, what did you find was the biggest issue using smartphone technology to make a feature length film? We lost him. Did we lose him? You, I think we may have lost him. Well, here, I'll, I'll tell you, until he comes back, I'll answer this question for him because Pat was our cinematographer for the film. Pat, are you back? No, we lost him. All right, listen, I'm going to answer this for him. So uh, when Pat, Pat, you back? I hope I'm back. I can see you guys. <laughs> All right. Did you hear the question? I did not, but please, I mean, you're qualified. Please answer. What was the hardest thing about shooting with a cell phone? Well, uh, the hardest thing about shooting with a cell phone was getting the image that we wanted. There were intimate images that the cell phone didn't do well at because everything was focused. So we had to build a bit of optics around it. Um, audio, I'll just say it again. You know, bad audio ruins great video. You know, you don't notice audio. So cell phones really don't care much about audio right now, it seems. I haven't found a great cell phone that will do like a Bluetooth wireless lavalier mic and that would change things dramatically but the biggest challenge was just audio and optics trying to get depth of field which we which we achieved we worked around it outside the cell phone so that was the hardest thing so even though there's a whole host of mobile phones with fantastic cameras out there does everyone have the soft skills required to take a photo so whether that's um i don't know for example framing a shot balancing lighting conditions, and just really having that eye for detail. I believe so. I believe, I believe everyone, you know, has an artistic uh, viewpoint, whether we share their viewpoint. Uh, again, art is in the eye of the, the viewer. I've seen art that I don't even know it's art. I walk past it and someone says, oh, that's the installation. So that's the great thing about art. So the answer to your question is yes, everyone does. Does everyone have the motivation? or desire to do that? No, um, but it's become more and more ubiquitous because I see lovely, beautiful photography that comes from cell phones. I think in New York, my daughter went to college in New York and there was an installation of just cell phone photography. And I, I don't, I was just jaw dropped the whole time. I couldn't believe what people were doing with filters and other things. So yes, yes, and yes to all your questions. Everyone should and could. Fantastic. And how about you, Human? Uh, do I think I, I I agree with Pat mostly. I um I think you know when it comes to filmmaking, uh, I'm in the camp that really believes that you need to get an amazing team around you. Mm -hmm. I think the team around you is everything. And when one person now look, we did an independent film. We did it for about 500 grand and we, we had to be uh, very lean, but you, you know, when you're making a, a project at, at this level with Jenna Rollins and, but you know, by the grace of God, we got Dolly Parton's music in the film. Um, you need to, you need to go out of your way to recruit the very best cinematographer you can find and the very best editor you can find. And even like, you know, the things that you would think were throwaway are not throwaway. You got to find the best hair and makeup person. You got to find the best wardrobe person. You even have to find the very best PA, the, the production assistants, the people running to get coffee and, and, and basically kill themselves to, to do everything they can to make the scene good for you. So I, yes, there is like, you know, everybody can be creative, but with filmmaking, it is 100 people collaborating every day to and then you you have ultimately have a director who figure who has to choose which path to go down. So with us, you know, uh, we ended up getting a really amazing uh, editor named Philip Bruno, who uh, worked on The Dark Knight. So uh, and then we had an incredible um, uh, per, a composer named Jacob Yaffe, and and these are people that we didn't originally have when we started this project. They came, you know, at the very tail end. So even as you're shooting and even as you're, you're making art, you have, you can't stop looking. You, mm -hmm. you can't settle. You have to, you have to constantly be pushing the envelope and, and making calls and networking. It's, it's very complex. It's incredibly stressful. 
when when you're doing filmmaking, you you need a thousand miracles a day. Uh, every single day on the set, at least eighty things went wrong, and you're you have to constantly adapt and adjust and figure out a way to make it work. Um, and then there's a, a million other issues I could I could tell you about where you have to you know accommodate actors and they want lines changed the last minute and you're like no problem we'll do that for you and so yeah it's tough when you're the director you've got to keep all the balls in the air keep juggling everything but once you have that final product and your team really does come together it really is just beauty isn't it it is yeah yeah you're on an incredible adrenaline rush for you know the 25 i mean I was listening to Mel Gibson and Denzel Washington and a few other directors, uh, you know, talk about filmmaking, and they all and Oliver Stone, they all equated it to literally being in a war. You're you're in a war, and mm -hmm. it's it's that tense at times where you're just like, how am I even going to get through the day? And you know, miracles happen. And that's why I'm saying you need a thousand miracles every time you shoot. Definitely. So just to change the conversation slightly, I wanted to ask you both about marketing. What do you think is important about marketing? And what do you think someone from real estate, for example, could learn from the film industry? Well, let me apply it to film first, and then Pat can um, talk about it in terms of the real estate as well. So you're, you're bringing up a very um, uh, difficult, uh, topic to address for filmmakers because often filmmakers only think about making the movie and they don't think about marketing or distribution. And um, with with marketing, marketing and distribution are uh, two halves of the same bullet. Okay, and the you know when you're done with the film, you have a gun in your hand and you have this bullet, which you can only fire one time. So if you can only fire it one time, you need to have a very clear target. Like you need to be standing right in front of that target, right in front of that bullseye, and then you shoot. Mm. And um, like, for example, with Olive, we still haven't distributed it yet. After eight years, we're still holding on to it because I'm looking and Chris Kelly's looking for the, if, it's, if there's such a thing, the perfect distribution opportunity. Um, we know we have a great film. And the reason we know that is because Dolly Parton, out of the goodness of her heart, wrote and performed five original songs for the film out of the goodness of her heart. Cause she, she watched the movie and she said, your movie makes me want to go out and help people. So uh, the, it's, it's tricky. It's very tricky because you, the amount of money that's required for a marketing campaign is almost as much as the film itself. Mm. Okay. And then you, you want to have partners that really believe in your film and will push your film out. You're, you know, even though we're independent filmmakers, we're competing with, you know, everybody at Warner Brothers and Fox and uh, and uh, Miramax and Disney. Like, you know, because we're independent, we don't we don't get a, 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 any kind of pass. It's it's still, you know, we're in the big leagues at the end of the day. So um, you just have to be really smart. You have to find the right partners. You got to get the best people around you when it comes to that. And then, you know, we have, you know, we, we don't have to distribute this film immediately. We can hold on to it and we can wait for the perfect opportunity. And a lot of people don't have that, you know, they've mortgaged their homes, they have loans out from the bank, so on and so forth. You know, we don't have that. So I don't know if you can apply any of that to real estate, Pat, but that's, that's kind of the, the film perspective of it. Well, real quickly for the real estate end, and I do a lot of real estate videos, um, you know, video has overwhelmed print, advertising, print media. Print is still there to a certain degree with, you know, memes and things like that. But video is just showing us catching people's eyeballs more often. And so as an agent with a listing and you get a professional and you do video, you're branding, obviously marketing the home itself, but you're also... Putting your, best, putting your best pitch forward because you can edit yourself through it or rehearse your pitch. And you're, putting, you're marketing yourself. You're marketing your firm. Um, and you're marketing this greater sort of 
all-encompassing brand of yours. So video is very, video's very powerful. You know, we've gone from newspapers to, you know, uh, to 144 characters on a tweet and to even seven seconds and 15 second videos. So it's very powerful. So marketing, I do believe that if you're not doing video and you don't have a, a visual moving video, video moving picture presence, then you're missing a big part of marketing. Uh, video is very powerful now. It can sneak in everywhere. As we were, as we talked about earlier, video can sneak all the way to your cell phone. You know, so video is very powerful and marketing is very important. So you market yourself, you market your property, you market your firm, you all work together to create, you know, more satisfied customers, whether they're people looking for a listing agent or, you know, people that are looking to buy can see through video and they can see you and they can see, you know, how you present yourself and they want to work with you because of the way you look and sound and tell your story. So real quickly, I should have done, I should have done that shorter, <laughs> but <laughs> in real estate, it's all encompassing. Marketing is so important, as you all know. A hundred percent. So my last question for you both is, if you were a real estate agent, should you be considering moving away from your photographer and doing it yourself with a smartphone? Oh, no, we lost Pat. No, He's okay. like, <laughs> do you get the question? He's back. Excellent. He's yes, back. Yeah, so, um, you know, what I just said was putting your best pitch forward, your best foot forward, your best, you know, face forward and the best product. So I, I still do believe there's a lot of room to partner with professionals to do this. Listen, I, I, I own an Ari Alexa. You know, these are the most, you know, uh, I think most expensive cameras, you know, in Hollywood other than antique cameras. They're really expensive cameras. And I still go out regularly with a small gimbal and an agent will hand me their cell phone. I will put an audio recorder in their pocket and a lavalier mic on them and I'll follow them through their house and do a virtual tour on their cell phone. So, you know, uh, if I can humbly call myself a professional or working videographer, filmmaker, I use the cell phone because it's convenient fast. I'm, it's, if they, they already know that they can't really multitask, hold the cell phone, gimbal, get audio, and then, you know, trust their framing. So I don't think that cell phones are going to put filmmakers out of work. In fact, Human and I are sitting here talking about our cell phone movie, so it didn't, you know, hurt us. So your question, to, I answer your question as a no. You can do it yourself, but if you want the best look, filmmakers will always make you look your best. That is their job. Uh, he or she will look through the camera and say, how does my subject look? It's hard for you to do that yourself because you're critical of your own looks. And you might not be able to be objective, but the professional filmmaker is still uh, a resource to be leveraged in your business. If I could just add one thing to that. Um, look, I don't know the world of real estate nearly at the level Pat does, but I have seen my fair share of realtors trying to make their own video and it's not good. I mean, <laughs> I walk away and I'm like, uh, like, and I'm, I'm not on the house. I'm not on the market to buy a house or anything like that, but and then you, you see, you know, these palatial estates in Beverly Hills and you're like, wow, that was shot great. I would love to be able to afford that house. And I know that uh, there are people who literally spend hours upon hours just looking at videos of homes. Like, that's a hobby. That's a real thing. And I get videos sent to me all the time from people going, you got to check out this house in the south of France. It's for sale for $40 million. And you're like, wow, I want this. I want this house. But, it, you know, clearly they had an amazing team behind the video. So, yeah, you, you do you do need to get the right team on board. Definitely. Whether it's a movie or a house. Superb. Well, thank you so much for coming along to today's webinar. It's been a joy speaking with you, and I think you've given us some fantastic pieces of wisdom. Now, of course, we are rooting for Olive, and we can't wait to see it. When you do get those distribution rights, you have to let us know so we can head out and see it in cinemas. Now, once again, thank you so much for joining us today.
Everyone watching at home, that concludes our session for today. And we're looking forward to seeing you on Tuesday next week for our Tips Tuesday session. So until then, thank you very much and keep it 360. Bye.